Welcome to this Day One Conversation. I'm Peter Wallace, and with me today is the Reverend Mark Sargent. Mark is the pastor of Embry Hills United Methodist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Mark, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Peter. Glad to be here. Now, you're doing a lot of thinking and writing about the Christian faith in the 21st century, including on your new blog at dayone.org. You've introduced some of these concepts on three Day One programs in early 2006. The series was called Into the Brave New World, and we received by far the most requests for transcripts and CDs than any other programs that I can recall. People seem to be hungry for this Christianity that makes sense in their lives and in this world. How would you briefly describe this progressive form of theology? What's different about it? Well, Peter, in light of the fact that the modern period did actually take place and that we know things in 2009 that people in 1609 and 1409 and 1209 did not know, uh, the chief thing, I think, that distinguishes this Christianity from the brand of Christianities that we have known before is that it seeks to incorporate uh, modern scientific, historical, psychological insights and learnings into the articulation of the Christian faith. I confess I get frustrated that a large part of the population and particularly the media don't seem to realize that there are a lot of followers of Jesus who are spiritually mature and intellectually honest and psychologically savvy as you've described it. But is this a new phenomenon? Put, put this into some historical context for us. So many times when I'm watching, uh, I'll, I'll mention Bill Maher, for example, I do watch his show on a weekly basis, and oftentimes, being the religious satirist that he is, I will want to jump through the television <laughs> and be able to enter into a conversation with him and just say, wait a minute, wait right. a minute, there are Christians out here who are not backwards and who are not blind and who do have an education and who do welcome persons of different gender identities and sexual orientations. Um, so it really is sad. That, that we Christians get lampooned and caricatured in a way that really uh, itself represents kind of an unfair stereotype. In many ways, I think the, uh, the seeds for the kind of unfair stereotyping and caricaturing that goes on were planted in the late years of the 19th century, somewhat in response to Charles Darwin, who uh, tripped up uh, upon some discoveries that were very surprising to him and really world-shaking to a lot of people. But chiefly, um, the ascendancy of modern biblical scholarship, which uh, began to call into question the possibility of understanding the Bible as a literal scientific and historical document, that gave rise to a kind of Christianity that uh, sought to defend against mm -hmm. those insights rather than to incorporate them. And of course it's very difficult to incorporate those insights and begin to reimagine and rearticulate a Christianity that really is uh, that really is lively and smart and kind. I struggle all the time to preach about things like the ascension of Jesus or the uh, experience of Pentecost. I mean if these are not to be understood literally, how in the world are they to be understood as lively and and meaningful spiritual truths. But the beginning of the caricature and the lampooning, I think, uh, uh, traces its origin to the time when Christians, instead of incorporating uh, the insights of modernity, uh, instead felt uh, threatened by them and began to defend against them. Well, let's talk about some of the practical implications of all this for Christian communities. I know we could talk for hours about this, but help us understand first of all the desire to recapture what's been called the life tradition of the faith and leave behind the death tradition, including the concepts of substitutionary atonement of Christ, original sin, and so forth. I, I do understand, by the way, that there are uh, there will be hosts of people within Christianity who don't agree with me sure. on this, but uh, but I find uh, the idea of the substitutionary atonement to be really repugnant. Of course it's a it's a concept that comes up as a result of the thinking of a man named Anselm and as you well know there were lots of other ways of understanding the death of Jesus mm -hmm. and part of what we learned with the discovery of the Nag Hammadi documents for example is that there were uh, very diverse express expressions of Christianity in the early years after the life and death of Jesus, some of which that had nothing at all to do with the death of Jesus. Mm -hmm. we, we find uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, for example, a great emphasis on Jesus' life and on his teaching and not so much an emphasis on his death. I, I regard his death 
as uh, as a sad and tragic expression of, of human rebellion and and our uh, desire to to shoot and um, get profits out of the way uh, rather than to incorporate the very difficult truths that they come along preaching. Well, as you say, this is very controversial stuff, even in some progressive circles, but it's it's worth exploring. But the ramifications of this approach can impact our view of the sacraments of the church, for instance. And, and now you've gone to Medlin, but talk about how this might affect how we view the sacraments. Well, it is controversial, and I do understand that. Um, I, I live in and, and practice within that tension so much. I, I must say that I have uh, ceased in the way in which I practice the sacrament of baptism, for example, in praying over the water that God would bless this water to wash away the sin of the little person or the big person who's being, uh, who's being baptized. And I've rather come to think of baptism as, uh, as the planting of a really lovely plant in the good soil of loving human community. And for us to grow and bloom uh, like any a good plant does. We need water and we need light. And so there are plenty of images uh, that can be very meaningful to us, but, but you're absolutely right. Um, no longer can, in, in, my, in my ministry, no longer can I understand baptism as a cleansing away of original sin. I just uh, am not able, to, uh, not able to be there anymore. It certainly has implications for the way that we think of Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. And so in my mind, I've begun to think of Holy Communion as, a, as an experience of, of mutuality and uh, gathering together around the table of, of the man whom we regard as Lord, uh, whose way of life we find uh, worthy of emulation, a place where we can connect with one another and receive the nourishment that we need for the journey. Um, nourishment, uh, by the way, that I think we need to, to be bold and audacious in resisting the kind of uh, injustice and oppression to which I refer in my sermon. Mark, what are some of the best resources you've come across in helping your own thinking in this area? I guess I would think of two broad areas of research and inquiry. One would be the the significant new work that's being done in what I would call early Christian scholarship. Uh, people like Bart Ehrman at Chapel Hill and Elaine Pagels at Princeton and of course uh, all of the members of the Jesus Seminar, Marcus Borg and John Shelby Spong and the late Robert Funk, they've, they've all been very helpful to me in my understandings and I would sort of locate that in the, in the arena of, of Christian scholarship uh, or Christian theology. The, the other area that was very helpful to me is, is, the, uh, is the area of psychology and in the uh, fairly recent degree program I did at West Georgia uh, in looking into the psychological literature that that, um, that has to do with religious wounding and beginning to, to sharpen my understandings there. Mark Sargent, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you.